Welcome to the Washington Ethical Society. I'm Brian Pashigian, and my pronouns are he, him, and I'm the officiant today. Welcome to everyone for our multimedia platform. Whether you're here in the hall or watching on Zoom or catching the recording later, we are one community unified across time and space, gathering to affirm our values and commit to a better world. If you are on Zoom, please check the chat for welcome and various tips from, uh, let's see, I want to make sure, is it Joe this morning? Or, all right, I'm going to go with Joe. I want to make sure I'm saying the right person. And they're going to be our Zoom chat usher. And if you're here in the hall and would like assistance um, with a assistive listening device, please ask the sound team at the back. Thank you. Visitors, if you're here in person, please stop by the welcome table after platform today to speak to a greeter or our membership coordinator, Maceo Thomas. To those of you visiting online now or later, we invite you to send an email to Maceo at maceot at ethicalsociety.org or fill out a connection form, which you can find at tiny.cc slash westconnects. I'll now read a few of the greetings that folks have written in the Zoom chat. Folks joining virtually can use this time to get a candle to light during our candle lighting. Oh, all right. This is, I knew, uh, I always like to check. So it's Judy today as the Zoom usher. Thank you, Judy. And let's see, we've got, Mark sharing buenos dias to all. Barbara sharing good morning to all. Partly cloudy in Clearwater, Florida. It's great to be present. Wonderful. And then Joe's on there too. Good morning. And Judy giving a nice welcome. And Laura sharing good morning. While well, we look forward to our time together. And it is good to connect and to share this time together. Opening words this morning are from Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then. I contradict myself. I am large. I, can, I contain multitudes. Our opening music today is Wake Now, My Senses, performed by Sarah Jabian and Justin Furna.
Welcome once again. Each week, we read the, our statement of purpose as a reminder of our shared values. If you're interested in taking a turn to read the statement of purpose, you can sign up at tiny.cc slash read SOP. Today's reader is Sean Evans, a West member who recently moved to, from DC to Petaluma, California. Whenever you're ready. All right. Hi, my name is Sean Evans, and I've been a member here at West for almost 10 years. It's been a very important community for me here in the DC area. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm starting the new chapter of my life and moving back to the San Francisco Bay Area. And so I wanted to read the statement of purpose for the West community before I leave. The Washington Ethical Society is a humanistic congregation that affirms the worth of every person. We strive through our relationships to elicit the best in the human spirit. With faith in human goodness, we appreciate each person's unique capabilities, capacity, sorry. We joyfully celebrate together and support each other through life. We nurture a sense of reverence and responsibility for each other and the earth. We warmly invite you to join our community of children and adults as we work for a world where love and justice cross all borders. Thanks and good luck. Thank you, Sean, for a beautiful and very realistic statement of purpose. As Casey lights our community candle, I invite those of you with candles at home to light yours and for everyone to join in our candle lighting words. May we kindle within us the warmth of compassion, the light of understanding, and the fire of commitment to build a brighter future for all. Our time for all ages story today is What Are Your Words? A book about pronouns. My uncle Lior is coming to visit today. I can't wait to show them around my neighborhood and I can't wait for my neighbors to meet them. Lior is my favorite uncle. They have many beautiful, colorful hats. The garden at their house is magical. They are a biologist and look at teeny tiny living things under a microscope. I learn a lot from Uncle Lior, like that people can be described by more than what they look like or what they do. In fact, there are a lot of words to say who people are and how they feel. Some of those words are pronouns. Pronouns are words that can take the place of your name, like I, me, you, she, he, or they. Uncle Lior knows how important my words are to me because I am always growing and changing. And some of my words change with me. So every time they visit, they ask, what are your words, Ari? Sometimes I know my words right away. Happy, creative, funny, he, him. Sometimes I have to think about my words. Thoughtful, athletic, silly, she, her. Sometimes I have to try my words out. Sleepy, calm, honest, am. Sometimes I just use one set of pronouns. Sometimes I change my pronouns. Sometimes I use all of the pronouns I can think of. My pronouns are like the weather. They change depending on how I feel. And that's okay, because they're my words. This time, when Uncle Lior asks about my words, I have a problem. I don't know what words to use, I cry. I can't decide which pronouns fit today. That's okay, Uncle Lior tells me, their smile warm. You have all day to think about it. But I want to word, know my words now. 
He and him feel squirmy and wriggly to me. Those aren't right. I'll have to think about my words later because it's time for Uncle Lior, my sister Rachel, and me to head to our neighborhood's big summer bash. Summer is my favorite season and barbecues are my favorite kind of party. Rachel dances and sings in the street, twirling around and making me laugh. Rachel has her own words. Her pronouns don't change, but sometimes she is quiet instead of loud. Today, she is loud. Mrs. Bolton walks behind us, laughing at her friend Charlie's joke. Mrs. Bolton's cat chases Charlie's little brown dog up and down the sidewalk. Mrs. Bolton and Charlie each have their words too. Our neighbor Anna tinkers with her car in the driveway. When I first met Anna, she had a different name and used different pronouns. But now she goes by Anna and uses she and her every day. She is my favorite neighbor. I'll be there soon, she calls. And if you were looking a little closer at this, you would see at the top, everybody has some adjectives and some pronouns attached to them. So for example, neighbor Anna says, mechanic, polite, vegetarian, she, her. We see Robin Day and their kids drawing with chalk. When I introduce Robin to Uncle Lior, I use their words. Uncle Lior says hello and tells Zir their words too. We'll see you at the bash, they say. Neighbor Robin says, artistic, sweet, kind. Zizer. Lior says, playful, collector, gardener, they, them. Ava and George from the ivory covered house are on their way to the summer bash. Nice to meet you, Lior, Ava says. They are Uncle Lior, I explain proudly. Everyone laughs. Rachel laughs the loudest and turns to me. What are your words today, Ari, she asks. I think about my words. She and her feel crackly to me. Those won't work today. Why can't I figure out which words to use? I want to be able to share them with everyone. When we arrive at the bash, we see our new neighbor. Hello. My name is Ari. What are your words? I ask. Hi, Ari. I'm Avery, and I use they and them, they reply. Like my Uncle Lior, I say. What are your other words? Avery thinks, my other words are teacher, friendly, and loyal. What are your words? Avery asks. I scrunch my face. I thought I would know by now. I'm not sure what fits today. I tell them. I try some other words. A and ear feel heavy and bumpy to me. Those don't fit either. You'll figure it out, Avery tells me. Sometimes it just takes patience. But I don't want to be patient. It shouldn't take this long to find my words. Everyone else seems to know theirs. I go to my Uncle Yor and tug on their sleeve. I still don't know my words. That's okay, Uncle Yor says reassuringly. They're your words. They don't disappear if you don't know them today. Maybe you'll know them tomorrow. Soon it is time for fireworks. I wait for the show to start just like I've been waiting all day to figure out my words. Waiting makes me buzzy like a bee and makes my skin feel itchy. When the first explosions finally burst into the sky, everyone gasps. Suddenly, I feel my words fall into place. Sometimes I know my words right away. Sometimes I have to think about my words. Sometimes I have to try my words out. But sometimes I have to wait for my words to find me. I squeeze Uncle Lior's hand. Uncle Lior, I whisper excitedly. What? They ask. There's another boom of fireworks and colors race through the sky. I point. Those are my words. I'm like fireworks. And they and them feel right today. Fireworks, Uncle Lior says with a laugh. 
They squeeze my hand back. That's definitely you, Ari. My words finally found me. They and them feel warm and snug to me. These pronouns are perfect. When the fireworks are over, we walk home, all our words floating with us. And our pronouns, too. Hi there, I haven't met you yet. My name is Ari. My words are impatient, bouncy, excited, nervous, colorful, and hopeful. And today, my pronouns are they and them. What are your words? I invite you to keep thinking about all of the words that are you as we continue our time together. Thank you. Let us enter now into the centering time of our platform. Each week, we ring this chime in solidarity with people around the world. Today, I'm particularly mindful of the process of coming to an agreement with votes and the democratic process that is not always figured out on the first day after an election. As we listen to the chime, let us remember our connection to each other and the world around us. Let us open our hearts to compassion for those who suffer. And let us commit ourselves to the work that calls for our love. I invite you to take a moment to feel settled. Take a deep breath in if that works for you. Maybe place your feet on the floor. Maybe you need to stretch a little bit, mindful of that you have neighbors probably. As you keep breathing and centering, I invite you to think of a river, a river that starts high in the mountains and makes its way towards the sea, a river that changes the ground around it as it flows, a river that takes in from the soil around it that is redirected by boulders and trees, but also eventually wears away at those very boulders and trees which change it. A river which is never the exact same way twice. Breathe and think of that river making its journey 
from cold, high up peaks, down through forests, through plains, breaking off into other smaller rivers, being joined by other rivers, flooding out into the world around it or drying up away from its shores, connecting finally with everything else. Big, vast ocean. Connecting back up to the clouds to rain down somewhere else and maybe become another river. Changing and changing and changing causing change around it, experiencing change within it. You too are like a river, changed by and changing everything you touch. We'll continue our meditation in silence and then in song. Mystery, mystery, where do we come from? A mystery, where do we come from? Mystery, why do we go on a mystery? Where do we come from? Mystery, are we? Life, where are we going? Where do we come from? Mystery. reading today 
It's titled Make Me a Vessel for Anomaly, written by Simon Iris, found in Gender Outlaws, The Next Generation. Editors Kate Bornstein and S. Bear Bergman. Call me boy. 16 years ago, you would not have believed it. I am what I had 16 years ago. You would not have believed it. I am what I had never intended to be. There is this wildness inside me. And they tell me, say, call me boy. Like boy will tame this unkept spasticity and ferocity. Like boy will mend the broken parts of me that fight tirelessly for the right to decay and die. Like I will ever be this spoon-fed, white bread, maniacal, joust at ma masculinized life. And like they would like it anyways. They don't, and they wouldn't. They tell me I'm so strong, and they say, boy, like I want to hear it. And I wouldn't, and I don't. But they feel calm, convinced that this transition has ended, not fruitlessly, that this boy in me has emerged beautifully and fully grown, owing names and space like real estate, like it was theirs for me to take back to begin with. There is this myth called boy that walks behind me. One foot stays planted sometimes, and I rush to advance, but he moves with me in circles. There are times I am sure you cannot distinguish a leader. Sometimes I feel his breath on my neck, and I can hear them when they yell, sir, and they are talking to me, but they see him instead. I try and I try and I try to move away, but he trails me. He prevails, though I think I stand above his height and honing in on me, my ever constant shadow. They lose me and I become him. There is this boy called myth that I could never be. Sometimes he hovers in front of me. I am bathed in his trailing effervescence, and there is something in him that I long for in my hours of wanting. I cannot tell you where I end and he begins, where his mood shifts and becomes my demeanor, careening untamed. When he is angry, I am furious, and when he is quiet, I am stiff and cold. When he loves, I am enamored with the world and mindlessly emancipated by the beating of his heart. I follow and they call me boy because I want to be strong. They tell me, say, call me man, like man matches this wild yearning for gender freedom. Like raising casts and glasses to toast my newfound privilege marks achievement. Like I don't grieve with every time I pass. Feel a weighted void where my gender used to be. See my gender bleeding helplessly on the curb, kicked and downtrodden by odd words like man crying for recognition. Blundering down a hollow hallway, saying, call me nothing instead, and waiting to be released. There's this girl that is not yet empty. She was there and they loved her. But firm in her absence, this ragdoll wild boy emerged, and she and all her glory were left to flounder and fall into the fire of sheer memory. And now they call me girl. Lips curl and grin with sinful pleasure in having wronged me, robbed me of the prize of masculinity. And I wonder where they put she in me and when she will be allowed to enjoy his femininity. She will perspire under the flame of interrogation and question her home in me. And they will say, tell them that was never me. But I flinch and hear her calling and flinch and feel her tugging at my sleeve and flinch and she is suddenly in me and I wonder, if it would be more simple to remove my skin from the equation and let her bleed my history. She is a mountain of accidents and simple requests, and she is only waiting for her avalanche. There is something like a story. They will never eradicate from me this need to create, that I want to show them what I could do if they would release my hands from the stalks of my body. Show them butch like I mean it, and stone like I've lived it, and survivor to the ends of the earth. I earn this wounded grin and spinning prism of names. I will dance for the love of dancing like I embrace gender for the love of bending bodies and words into something. 
I can call restitution and remedy. And make my he a being strong in his arbitrary divinity. There's a constant fragility in his awareness of who he was and where she is. And the knowledge that they are bound forever with rope tighter than any knot he could tie around wrists and ankles and necks. Crane to see him when she is at his most dominant or cloth tied across her eyes when all he wants to do is forget. I'm wandering barefoot through broken territory. There is a restlessness in me, like the crashing of waves on shorelines, and he wants to know when she will have the spotlight again. He moves in between her and she will discover new places in me to rest and grow. There is a breath, breathless reprieve. She will hold herself in his hand and ask quietly what it means. Make me a vessel for anomaly. I will find refuge in the spaces between. Call me Genesis. She is born. He is here. I am rising. This Sunday, we are hearing from senior leader Casey Slack, and they'll be talking to us about heretics and the last person to be officially tried. Nope, that is not what they will be sharing about. Somehow, I feel like it has to do with dichotomy. And I'm going to let Casey take it away from here. Thank you, Brian. The country song that gets stuck in my head periodically. Okay, there are a lot of country songs that get stuck in my head periodically, but one that comes up whenever I want to talk about what it's like to be a person. Not just what it's like to be a trans person, not just what it's like to be a queer person, what it's like to be a person. It's from the 90s and the singer's first name is Tracy, but I can't recall his last name at this time. And the lyric that sticks in my head is, the only thing that stays the same is that everything changes. Everything changes. This is at the core of what I know about what it's like to be a person what it's like to be an alive being in a world full of alive beings and even unalive beings that continue to change constantly. It's a truth seen more easily in a place with seasons, like this one, than in a place without, like Los Angeles, where I recently lived. It's a truth that is easy to see if you're looking close enough up or wide enough out, but gets a little messy in our in-between. If, like Uncle Lior in our Time for All Ages story, you are a biologist who looks at things under a microscope, you will see that most of those things move and change a lot. That they are held together by, well, strong and less strong bonds. That they are changeable. If you are a chemist, you know perhaps even more about how these things can change the ways in which substances turn into each other and back, or don't. If you are a historian, as you know I sort of am, you will notice that things change and don't change, kind of rhyming circle of history. 
if you have been in a body for 10, 20, 40, 60, 80 years, you will know that your cells change, that you change as time continues. There is a myth that says that the entirety of the cells in our body flip over every seven years, and while that is not true, we do have different skin about once a month and a different lining to our stomach and digestive systems every couple of days. Our blood is constantly remaking itself. In short of, sort of a ship of thesis way, are we ever one thing? The only thing that stays the same is that everything changes. Change is one of the most consistent things in the universe. Even the continents are not the only place they could ever be, right? Even the ground we walk on is constantly becoming a new thing. But for a lot of human history, we've been very involved in the idea that things have thingness that is essential to them. That this podium is essentially a podium in some way, and if not essentially a podium, at least essentially wood that there is woodness to the wood that is unchangeable. Which is odd, given that we've all seen wood change into not wood anymore, given that fire can happen to wood quite so easily. But it's not just fire or human intention that can change the wood into not wood. Moisture can change wood into something decaying, a mushroom can eat a log. Stone, we think, stays forever. We like to make monuments out of stone. We like to talk about things etched in stone as though they were permanent. But water breaks stones too. And if you walk on the same stone stair over and over and over again for long enough, your feet will change a stone. Change is constant, and things are mostly on their way from one thing to another on some scale of time that we may or may not be able to readily observe. We've known for a long time that things are made up of other smaller things, right? That there are wood molecules inside the wood and that what happens when fire happens is that those molecules are undone and carbon is released, right? We have some sense of this kind of change. And we've known this for quite some time, but our historical belief in the thingness of things, the permanence of substance, persists in a lot of how people are used to thinking about the world. The Catholic Church officially thinks that trans people are as dangerous as nuclear weapons. Sometimes I say things that are true and I have to take a moment with the fact are as dangerous as nuclear weapons, as damaging to humanity and the structure of things, as mass death and radiation, as poisoning the land and water. And if a person believes that there is God and eternal substance and people eternal substances with essential qualities, people who you can play genital divination on and announce facts about based on what you see when a child is born. If these things are true, then anybody who says no threatens that whole structure of thinking. 
if you are allowed to make choices about yourself, if you are allowed to know yourself and say, I am the authority and I am changing, if you are allowed to own your own in-processness at all, this is a threat to the idea of an authority that comes from somewhere but inside us and among our agreements. If you think of gender, of sex, of sexuality as rather than fixed points with essential nature, something that would be unlike any other thing in the world, but processes, ideas, ways of living in a body. Well, you might start to question and pull apart some other things too. A fact is that trans people embody change in a way that both threatens traditional power structures for real and grants us some perspective on what it is to change. Now, to be clear, it is not the only thing that grants a person perspective on what it is to change. You can move and learn about changing. You can simply grow in your own body. You can attend to your aging in a way that gives you a lot of perspective. But there is something about making a decision to exit something you were assigned and live differently that is a kind of wisdom, a kind of epistemic grounding in what it is to be in a body, what it is to become and create and do that in community with other people. There is, after all, really no way to transition without somebody else being involved. At bare minimum, for many of us, is the social aspect of telling people who we are, of deciding, all right, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna ask people to use a different name, a different set of pronouns, something other than what I've been doing. This is a social experience of becoming together. And for a lot of us, for me, at first it was really scary and really exciting and really frustrating when people didn't come along with me. The first time in my life that I lived exclusively with they, them pronouns actually started while I was a chaplain resident at a Catholic hospital, which <laughs> You know, I've made a lot of decisions in my life. Interestingly, the space in the hospital where I was most seen, most respected in my own ability to determine what I am called was in the context of the clinical pastoral education classroom. I didn't bother to try to get patients or nurses on the floors to use the pronouns I prefer because that seemed like a mess. But in the CPE classroom, I started to be able to say who I was full time and to talk about how who I was affected both what I was doing and how I was experiencing what I was doing what it was like to play girl in people's hospital rooms and decide that that was okay. What it was like to come back and do something else. In clinical pastoral education, we engage in a action, reflection, action model of learning. So you try something, you come back to the classroom, you talk about how it went, and then you try another thing, having considered what did and didn't work the first time. I kind of think of my experience with gender in the same way. I have tried things and then seen how it works, decided in conversation with myself and my spouse and my other partners and in discussion with my friends and the universe, how it felt, what it was like to be the person who identified myself 
that way. In a different way, transition is impossible without others because somebody has to prescribe the hormones. Somebody has to give you them from the pharmacy. If you have a transition surgery, several people are involved in a really, really intimate way. I went to my doctor in Los Angeles and I said, I think I would like to take testosterone. And he said, okay, which was amazing. That is not how easy it is for most people in most places at most times. But my doctor was a doctor at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. I had been his patient for quite some time, and it was clear that I had really thought about this. The idea that somebody else is the expert on you gets in all of our ways. This is not something exclusive to trans people, though we see it really, really clearly. It is palpable in our lives. But each of us experiences other people telling us who we are, telling us what it is like to be a man, a woman, young, old, straight, queer, white, black, indigenous. We are told by others from a young age what it means to be a person, what it means to be an adult. If you spend any time with millennials or Gen Z, but in different ways, you will hear millennials say that we struggle with adulting, adulting, the kind of ordinary day to day of I got to wash the clothes and I got to make dinner and I got to make a decision every day for the rest of my life about what I'm going to have for dinner. Struggling with adulting because the pictures of adults that we saw as children are no longer possibility models. Because we have jobs that don't necessarily pay as much as they would need to for us to have, I don't know, a spouse at home who does everything else. Because none of us really have that anymore. You will notice that Gen Z makes fun of millennials for this in a very characteristically generational difference way of, come on, just pick what's for dinner. But we're all doing this together, actually, right? Our ideas about what it is to be an adult, what it is to be a man, a woman, a child, etc., are all a decision we've all made together, intentionally or otherwise, right? We say to each other over and over again, this is what it's like to be a person, and a lot of us cut off big pieces of ourselves to fit into somebody's idea of how we were supposed to be. And a lot of us having cut off those pieces to win a game that is frankly pretty stupid, are angry at anyone who dares to be something else. One of our places of agreement here at WES is that our goal is to elicit the best in ourselves and each other. We are aware of and committed to our collective process of becoming. One of the things that we can do to encourage our own growth and each other's is to trust each other, to be our own experts on our own experience. To trust that you know better than I ever will what it's like to live in your body and that I know better than you ever will what it's like to live in my body and that the truth of what it's like to be a person lives somewhere in between and not just in between two but in between 10 and 20 and 277 and several hundred thousand and millions and billions of humans and other life forms interacting with each other and making what is next. 
One of my favorite things about that Time for All Ages book is how comfortable it is with not knowing the words yet. That's hard. It's really hard to not know how to describe yourself. It's really hard to say, ugh, these words I've been using do not fit anymore. It's hard to let go of an identity, to take on an identity, to merge identities into something else entirely. It's hard in our individual bodies and it's hard in our communities and it's necessary. Because who you were yesterday isn't necessarily who you'll be tomorrow. Because even wood and stone and rock Rivers and trees and the tallest of sculptures and buildings, they all change. None of it will stay forever. And all of it is just a face. Thank you. Thank you so much, Casey. In a few minutes, we'll have our community sharing time when you can write into the chat or share in person about what resonated with you in this platform. While we listen to today's musical response, you might prepare by reflecting on a personal experience, an activity, and the idea of change. is turning the world is turning the world is turning do you feel like your hearts break and do you feel like your souls shake and do you feel like the earth's quaking under your feet well it must be the world turn it must be the systems burn it must be the truth Yearning to be set free Do you feel like your hearts break? Do you feel like your souls shake? Do you feel like the earth's quaking Under your feet Well, it must be the hope Reach it must be the young ones Teach it must be the people Marching to fill the streets Do you feel like your heart This is the time when we add our own voices to the morning. 
sharing our reflections on the platform or what resonates with our personal experience. For our online participants, I invite you to share in the Zoom chat or in the comments if you're watching the recording later. If you're here in person, you can come to the microphone here on the floor, but please keep your comments brief so others may also share. I'll start by reading some of the initial comments in Zoom. Caitlin shares that was wonderful. And going back just a, a few minutes before, Maceo shared um, a thank you to Sean for sharing uh, her goodbyes as she transitioned in her move. Communities are not static. People come and go and pause. We appreciate your participation in Wes, as, and you are, of course, always welcome here. And as a few others come in, I'll turn attention to the commenters in the hall. Please begin by sharing your name and pronouns and, and keep your comments brief as we give everyone a chance to share. Thank you. Hi, good morning, I'm Kao, she, her. Um, I love the title and how you didn't really go there with the title and you left it to us. Um, I can remember all the times I was told it's just a phase uh, and that it would pass and I would return to whatever everybody wanted back again. And I, I really like thinking about that and what you were talking about regarding a journey and a constant journey of change and that it isn't a phase, it's a constant evolving. And I also was thinking about when our daughter was young and reading Brazelton, and I loved Brazelton because Brazelton helped us to understand when Blake would fall apart. And his theory was that when your child completely falls apart, it's because tomorrow your child is gonna do something amazing. And that you need to fall apart before you can reassemble, before you can put it all together, before you can figure it out. Um, so the story that you built in and your story at all was weaving together in such a beautiful way. I thank you so very much. Hello, Jeff here. So Casey, the Catholic Church feels you're more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Um, now, I, I just had this notion that maybe when you were interacting with the staff at this Catholic hospital, did they have to wear lead-lined gowns so as to protect you from any sort of trans leakage? Um, and instead of, say, a Geiger counter, was there a trans counter? So that we just started going, yee, doctor, the reading on the trans counter is through the roof. Oh, my God, we'll have to evacuate the hospital. Um, yeah, I, as a note, uh, what I was... Uh, doing my undergraduate uh, work at uh, American U, uh, I became quite interested in the theory and use and deployment of nuclear weapons. Uh, so, you know, Alcum, Slickums, Glickums, uh, Mervs, Marvs, Fratricide, you know, that sort of thing. And if given a choice between spending time with nuclear weapons and trans people, I'll, I'll choose the trans people. They don't go off the way the weapons do. <laughs> Hello, <clears throat> I'm Margaret. My pronouns are she and they. Um, and I haven't been in this building for almost three years, so it's good to be back. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share, I just so appreciated how you articulated just the, the nuance and complexity of gender and wanted to share, you know, when I, um, in my 20s, after being a very straight woman for many years, um, I became a lesbian. And the one, like, really, besides it being just this great, fabulous experience for me, the experience I had of gender at that point just completely warped. Being with a woman is so the, the, it made me realize how much my ex own experience of gender was so much about being in relationship 
two men. And when that was taken out of the equation, all of a sudden, everything was different. And fast forward many, many, many years later, and, you know, a few years ago, I did embrace um, and added they to my own pronouns as a continuation of that journey, basically, and understanding how that really was much a much fuller experience of my own gender. Um, it's not that one was wrong all those years, but by including they, it just fills out what my own experience is. And of course, understanding that it's so always in relation to other people and to what society is putting on us. And that's something I'm, you know, fighting against all the time and embracing and trying to change, so. Thank you to all who shared. And um, let me just check for a few more comments coming in with the chat as well. Um, Mark sharing, thanks to KC for helping me understand pronouns. And Barbara sharing, thank you, Wes, blessings. And Macy is sharing, uh, we miss you when we don't see you, Jeff. And, um, and Judy sharing, this is such a deep investigation into the subject. Thank you all. Thank you to all who shared their thoughts and attention. Just as we share our perspectives in this community, so too do we share our resources and gifts. Here at West, we split all undesignated gifts in the Sunday collection between our operating budget and a fund dedicated to justice and compassion. This month, we're sharing half of the offering with Casa Brumar and just sharing the mission statement to bridge the gap that leads, leaves the LGBTQ plus community behind when it comes to equality that is equitable in education, social services, and human dignity in the Commonwealth of Virginia and in Prince William County. Casa Brumar Foundation's charitable purposes are to provide a physical meeting space and community social services to at-risk and disadvantaged individuals experiencing homelessness, abandonment, and cruelty, especially members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. Among Casa Brumar Foundation's educational purposes are the encouragement and support of members of the LGBTQ plus community in their academic endeavors as they heal and rebuild after traumatic life changing experiences. Let's all take a moment to prepare to respond to the invitation to generosity. For those who are able to respond, we offer several options. As noted on the screen, the number to give by text is 202-335-1885. And you can donate via online via um, tiny.cc slash West Gives or by clicking on Give on our website, ethicalsociety.org. You can place cash or a check in the basket at the back of the hall on your way out as well. And you can always check, send a check by mail. Thank you for your generosity. We will now receive your gifts and the gift of music.
Thank you so much to the many people who helped create this morning's time together. Staff members Ndara Miles, Robin Kravitz, Maceo Thomas, and Tom Hutton. Um, intro music coordinator Leah Morris, tech team members John Lika and John Pfeiffer. Slide artists John and Abby Dakin. Zoom chat usher Judy O. Oh. And in person, in per, excuse me, in person greeters um, Donna Taylor and was Shayla here today? Maybe I was. Oh, okay. Sorry. And and Ann Baker. Thank you. Like everything in life, our script changes as well. <laughs> Just wanted to drive that point home with my examples this morning of trying to keep up with that. Um, and our virtual coffee host, um, I think, is Joe London today. Thank you. At the conclusion of the platform, please join us for social hour in person around the foyer and the patio, or for virtual coffee hour via, uh, via Zoom. First, though, I want to mention a few things upcoming in the life of our community. All right, first off, Jeff M has an announcement about next Sunday's Stone Soup celebration. Come on up, Jeff. Greetings, Wes. Well, yes, uh, fall is upon us. Indeed it is. The ginkgo trees have turned to yellows, and in the city, the winos have turned to reds. But enough about me. Fall is here, and yes, we have our annual fall classic. What is Jeff talking about, you may ask? The World Series? No, I'm talking about stone soup. <laughs> yes, we need a few more chefs, people who are willing to chop, mince, dice, and slice, and hopefully not decapitate themselves, to cut mounds of fresh vegetables, add gallons of vegetable stock, and the right amount of seasonings and herbs to create a delectable dish to be enjoyed by the community. As I say, we need one or two people, and plus we need some more dedicated people to clean up after the dedicated people. So you could talk to me, or you could talk to KC, or uh, there should be announcements coming up through the week. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now I'd keep an eye out for really good looking stones over the next few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got a biology reading group at 1 p.m. today. Please contact Paul Baker for Zoom info. And uh, we've got the start of our biology uh, reading group during our platform today, which is wonderful. Teen group uh, social and Let's see, is the teen group social and do, okay, DIY, uh, DIY project? The teens will be enjoying a social gathering and take on a do-it-yourself project, putting together air filters for Wes. Woo. This will also be an opportunity for teens to discuss what activities they would like to have this year. Um, those are both at one today. Um, we've got the Sunday Ethical Education for Kids, or SEEK program, has started. There are three cohorts. Pre-K to fifth grade, sixth to eighth, and the high school teen group um, until more volunteers who do not need to be parents are recruited to allow the program to keep expanding. If you want to play more of a role in the village that helps raise West's young people, please email Indara Miles at indaram at ethicalsociety.org. It's a great way to be involved in the community. That's it for today's announcements, unless I'm forgetting any, anything. Um, as always, you can find information about the opportunities to connect at the Sunday links or news and notes emails and the calendar page at Wes's website. So we continue with multimedia platforms. Attending can mean tuning in on Zoom or coming in person. And we are no longer requesting advanced reservations to attend in person. As those of you here today already know, uh, there's a check-in at the door. Thank you all for being part of West's platform today and I invite you to join in our closing song, Changes by Ziggy Marley, performed by Leah Morris. Hello, Hello. Wes, and welcome to November. Whew. This month's song of the month is called Changes. That's by Ziggy Marley, son of Bob Nesta Marley. Um, recently, somebody made a comment that we that Wes has never had a spoken word song of the month. So while this is not exactly a spoken word song of the month, there is a part 
right in the middle, I think, sort of the climax of the song that lets us kind of toy with moving towards the spoken word song of the month. So without further ado, your changes. Changes, changes, changes for ordinary people. Changes, changes, changes for ordinary people. There's so much beauty in each breath that we take. Oh, won't you tell me? Can you? of the few we can find religion in the freedom we choose there's so much hurt all over the place oh can't you tell by the look on my face there's just one thing i want to convey changes changes Last few uh, reminders before we leave. If you're new to our community, please send an email to our membership coordinator, Macy Thomas, and introduce yourself. For those who wish to socialize online, to reach virtual coffee hour, point your browser to tiny.cc slash west coffee hour. It won't be in the same meeting as the platform. And now I invite you to join me in our closing words for the month. Let us go into the week ahead with compassion, understanding, and commitment to mutuality, bringing our whole selves and honoring the fullness of one another in our quest for a better world. Thank you all for joining today's platform, and we look forward to connecting with you all soon.